some technical difficulties before the honorable Supreme Court of Texas. Our admonish to draw near and give their attention. The court is now sitting. God save the state of Texas. This honorable court. Please be seated. We'll hear argument in three cases this morning. First is 23-231, PUC versus Limited Energy. Uh, direct appeal from the Public Utility Commission and through the Third Court of Appeals District. Justices Hill and Young are not participating in that case. Second is 22-1167, Henry Richardson's Motorsports. Petition for Rip Van Damas from Dallas County and the 5th Court of Appeals District. And then finally is 23697, the State v. Lowe, a uh, direct appeal from the 201st Judicial District Court of Travis County. The court has allotted 20 minutes per side in each of the cases and will take a brief recess between them. Uh, we'll, we'll finish the arguments before the lunch recess. Uh, the arguments are being uh, broadcast live on the court's website this morning and should be available in the archives later. Justice Devine cannot be present this morning, but expects to be uh, to participate in the decisions of all three cases. We're ready for argument in 23-231. May it please the court. Ms. Pettit and Ms. Reeser have been appointed for argument for the petitioners. Petitioners have reserved five minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Market participants have long been on notice that in times of scarcity, electricity will trade at the regulatory cap. When that didn't happen during Winter Storm Uri, Luminant, among others, demanded something be done. PUC responded by directing ERCOT to fix the pricing anomaly, and at the time at least, Luminant cheered. Now, it demands this court invalidate those orders. I will focus today on why the court lacks jurisdiction <coughs> to grant this most recent request. And I will start with why the, these directives were not rules within the meaning of the APA and PURA, as that is likely as reasonable. Does the fact that the legislature has since made it perfectly clear that this type of authority did exist when there's an emergency situation that opposes an imminent threat. Does that go against your argument? No, Your Honor. It, it reaffirms that the authority existed at the time. We cut back a bit on the authority by using limiting language, but the authority itself, as written at the time, was sufficiently broad to cover these directives. So you're saying it wasn't an amendment, it was just a clar clarification? Yes, Your Honor. Turning to why these particular directives were not rules, which is the easiest way for the court to resolve the case, under Section 39.001 and 11.007 of the Utilities Code, the definition of rule for the purposes of the APA and PURA is the same, which means a statement of general applicability that interprets, imp uh, implements, or prescribes a law. That is not what happened here in either sense. As this court recognized in WBD Oil, to be a statement of general applicability is a statement that affects the public interest in a way that requires public input before becoming a law. And as this court reaffirmed in El Paso Hospital District, a statement that, pre that reaffirms a previous policy is not itself a rule. Here, the rule is so an emergency rule can't be a rule because you didn't get public input? No, Your Honor. This, it is a de the definition of the, it's affected with the public interest in a way that can't be, that can't become law in the way in, without public input and is defined against an order which is an adjudication that is an, a result, resolution of individual rights. Why isn't this an amendment, why wasn't the, the order an amendment of the existing pricing rules? So the existing pricing rules, and I would point your honor specifically to section 25.505 G6, say that the volume, value of lost load during is set at the regulatory cap and sets that regulatory cap at $9,000 at least at that time. The understanding of everybody in the market was that that was the price that when load was being lost that would be charged. And what happened here was not an amendment to that rule, 
but instead a direction to ERCOT that your system is just, your algorithm's not working the way it's supposed to. So please go fix it and get in line with the rules we've already established. I think which uh, as Luminet argues that uh, uh, earlier earlier in the consideration of pricing rules, load shed was considered as a factor and not adopted. Uh, does that give some indication that uh, load shed is part of the pricing rules and this was sort of an amendment uh, to pricing? No, Your Honor, although the court doesn't need to look at this because this is a rule challenge and typically you would be limited to the administrative record that was filed with the Third Court of Appeals. Luminance, as the, 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 set, the discussion to which Luminance is referring, is included in, I believe it is tab A, the Calpine Supplemental Appendix. And in there, the discussion makes very clear that load shed is considered as part of the operating reserve demand curve. It's not double counted by having its own factor, but it's already there. So here, again, it is simply saying your algorithm is, is being confused by the fact that the swan is black, the color doesn't matter, please get it back in line, which is what CPS Energy says that ERCOT was supposed to do. Does it make any difference? Luminant argues that uh, the pricing cap did nothing to address uh, the shortage of supply because the shortage of supply was not uh, driven by any, you know, it was just, there was, the market failed because there was no ability to generate additional supply. So, so do we look at whether the order was effective in addressing the problem of bringing on additional supply? Not at all, Your Honor, because this is a rule challenge. This court looks to the information that was available at the time under, I believe it was Cities for Fair Utilities. And at the information that was available at the time does not support them. They're relying on statements that were made after the fact. And, and so because it is, a, again, a rule challenge, it's limited to the administrative record, and it is under that standard and under the legal standard, not a rule because it is a direction to, be, to comply with existing rules. It's also not a competition rule, as that phrase is used in Pura, because it, and I would look to this court to the last sentence of 39.001A, which reflects that that entire section was adopted as part of the transition to, from a monopolistic market to a competitive market. Here, the rule was adopted under Chapter 39, which governs the utility. Uh, 25.505G6 was uh, adopted under that. And this order also references authority under Chapter 30. It also references chap authority under other chapters as well. So it certainly references to Chapter 39, but that so is it's not just a competition rule. Yes, Your Honor. Or, or, more, or more specifically, the, the 25.505 G6 is a competition rule. This is not a rule at all, and it doesn't go to well, the argument about that, but if we disagree with you about that, I thought you were moving on to the question of whether it's a competition rule. Yes, Your Honor. And so it's not a competition rule because it does not go to affecting the to adjusting the monopolistic and market abuse behavior. And I would also point, Your Honor, to 29.001C, which actually distinguishes between rules affecting competition and rules affecting competitors. This is a rule that undoubtedly affects competitors, as does everything else in this space. But the Over UC has labeled the scarcity pricing rules as competition rules, right? It has, right, it has labeled it to a certain extent, but not in the same sense. It is a rule that was created for situations where the market is not being competitive. So it is not regulating competition in the same sense that competition rules typically means. Well, it, this was about scarcity, right? This order was about trying to bring additional capacity on the line. So if the scarcity pricing rules are competition rules, then why would this order adjusting the price due to the scarcity be a competition rule if it's a rule? Because I would point your honor to 230 PU R4461, which says that these <laughs> Scarcity pricing mechanisms aren't about competition because, and I quote, they simply will not be activated in a competitive environment, page 24. It is a rule that is created for a regulatory context where there is no competition to be regulated. Even if your honors disagree with me about all of that, conclude that this is a rule and suggest that it is substantially compliant with the APA requirements. Because before, before we move on, if, if it is a rule, 
what are the practical consequences uh, of, of that, of, of its being a rule uh, for the Commission's ability to respond expeditiously to this kind of an emergency situation? If this is a rule, it has great consequences because by that definition, the load shed order, for example, that was that it was responding to and adjusting for is also a rule. And under those circumstances, the emergency rule requirements apply to all of it. And this is happening on a minute by minute, second by second basis. So this court should should take that into account, but it's obviously not dispositive because the question is whether or not this is a rule under the Texas under the text of the statute, and it's not. Turning to the system, I'm sorry. Any other questions? I'll ask you a question yes. about the, the APA. If uh, one of the requirements for the validity of a um, the, the procedural validity of an emergency rule is that it be filed with the Secretary of State, uh, how is not filing with the Secretary of State substantial compliance with filing with the Secretary of State? So substantial compliance requires that the law that the law uh, or that the action fulfills the legislative requirements in, in a general sense, and the requirement is notice and the opportunity to be heard, which is provided in this circumstance. But if your honor is concerned with that, I would point your honor to .0035D, which says a mere technical defect, which this is a technical defect, is not a basis for invalidity of a rule uh, without any proof of harm to the substantive rights of the party, and Lumina has never claimed it was harmed at the lack of notice to the what would you point us to to show that that's a technical defect, even though the statute says it doesn't become effective until it's filed with the Secretary of State? I would point your honor to 2001.005, which creates a similar requirement of indexing, and the, the legislature recently noted that it's not actually enforceable against somebody with actual notice. And here, the party had actual notice. There's that's not in dispute, and it's not in dispute that they were not substantively harmed. For that reason, it's not invalidated. I'll be back up in a few minutes. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Patty. Ms. Stokes, we'll hear from you. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. May it please the Court. With the Court's permission, I'd like to focus on what the Court should do if it reaches the merits of the Court of Appeals holding that the PUC exceeded its statutory authority. The question before the Court is a narrow legal one. Does the plain text of PURA authorize the PUC to order ERCOM to restore competitive price scarcity pricing signals to the electricity market and ensure the reliability of the electric grid? We submit that the answer is a resounding yes. As this court said just last year, PURA places two primary but intertwined duties on the PUC to ensure the reliability of the grid and to also ensure a competitive market with pricing based on the normal forces of competition. And that was already, as my colleague has noted, already incorporated into the PUC's existing rules at the time of the storm, that when we are in times of extreme scarcity, the prices will rise to the cap, consistent with scarcity pricing. But during this unprecedented storm, ERCOT's set of algorithms, the security constrained uh, economic dispatch, uh, did, it did not start, did not produce the competitive scarcity pricing that the rules called for and that everyone expected. And so the PUC exercised its complete authority over ERCOT, which this court has recognized, to order it to bring the pricing back in line with the rules. And in doing so, they prevented a collapse of the grid, and they also restored the um, normal forces of competition to the pricing. I think it, it's a myth that the respondents have perpetrated that before the order, everything was fine and prices were competitive. No, as ERCOT has explained in its amicus brief, it was an anti-competitive price before the orders were issued because ERCOT had, uh, had ordered massive load shed to save the grid. Uh, it, it, through the storm, it was 20,000 megawatts when one megawatt is enough to uh, power 200 homes for, for a day. So massive load shed, but that has, that save, helps temporarily save the grid, but it also artificially suppressed prices. And so the, or, the, the PC's rules under the operating reserve demand curve were designed to counteract that anti-competitive effect, bring prices back up to the cap. And when the ERCOT's algorithm didn't produce that result in these extraordinary circumstances, all that the PUC did was order them to bring that pricing back in line with what the rules required, with what a competitive market required. And Justice Bland, you asked- Can uh, I ask you, does it sorry. matter at all whether this is actually what- uh, I'm sorry? Uh, does it matter at all whether this is actually what 
help save the grid? That's an excellent question, Your Honor, and I think it, it, it ties in with what Justice Bland asked. I think it's a distraction by Luminant to say, was this successful? Did the PUC accomplish its statutory objectives? That this court said in Schroeder v. Escalator Ranch Owners Association that the statutory authority question is a legal one, and the court doesn't inquire into whether, whether it was a correct decision, whether it was a successful decision. And I think this is an attempt to distract from the textual um, decision that the court has to make here today. I think if we if we uh, talk about the Court of Appeals' particular reasoning, they, they, I, I don't think they they didn't base their uh, decision on the fact that these were uh, that they weren't successful. They said, well, the PUC can't act to save the grid, can't act to restore uh, pricing signals unless it's the most competitive uh, method possible. And I think that's a statutory misconstruction because they they highlight the, the one of the mandates, competitive pricing, to the entire exclusion of the other ma mandates to preserve the reliability of the grid. Um, and you can't read out um, entire provisions of PURA, as you note in our tab A, how many times PURA says the reliability of the grid, the reliability of the grid. You can't have a competitive electric market if you don't have a reliable electric grid. There wouldn't be any electricity to sell. Um, and I think the Court of Appeals here substituted its judgment for the PUC's technical judgment of the quickest way to restore competitive pricing, to restore the grid, and to get power back to the millions of people who were suffering in the cold and some dying. Um, and I think under State versus PUC, this court's decision, that was an impermissible uh, act. The court says, when an administrative agency is created to centralize expertise in a certain regulatory area, it is to be given a large degree of latitude in the methods it uses to accomplish its regulatory function. Now, I think the Court of Appeals violated that principle, but they also, it's a rudderless standard. They don't say what a more competitive means would have been. They don't say what is the PUC supposed to do in the next emergency. What are the guidelines for their decision making? And it leads to the absurd results. And I think some of the respondents go so far as to suggest that the PUC, PUC should have stood by and risked the collapse of the entire grid in the name of unfettered competition. I, I uh, maintain that there's nothing in PURA that required them to do that. Well, I think some of the respondents argue that uh, ERCOT could use the directive to come online uh, and that that's more competitive because at least there are make whole payments and uh, uh, higher pricing allowed by state. Are you talking about the reliability unit commitment, the rucking procedure that some of them say that they for force generators to come online? Well, I submit that ERCOT, and this is outside the record, but the limit is, is relying on outside the record, but ERCOT did consider that, and it's a plant-by-plant -plant cumbersome process, and they decided that it was not quick enough in their technical judgment. But also, the problem with the internal inconsistency with that argument is that rucking, as they call it, is itself an anti-competitive measure. Ordering, ordering market participants to sell um, is at a cost is not a competitive measure either. It would fail under the Court of Appeals decision as well. Uh, and I think also, in, in terms of implications of this decision, if the Court of Appeals' pernicious statutory authority reasoning is allowed to stand, it calls into question many regulations that have been in effect for a decade that um, allow the agency to use its expertise to uh, ensure a competitive market, ensure an electric grid, but affect price, such as the high, high system-wide offer cap, the low system-wide offer cap. Um, even load shed itself that affects prices, all, all that rucking, all of these things um, would be called into question, but the Court of Appeals ignored the uh, impacts of its order. Uh, I see I'm, I'm running out of time. If the Court doesn't have any more questions, I'll leave it at that. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Stokes. We'll hear from the respondent. <laughs> May it please the Court. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. If the rule of law means anything, it means that administrative agencies have to follow the law, just like ordinary citizens do, even, or perhaps especially, in times of emergency. Although there is a lot that's very complicated about this case, the two rules that require affirmance are simple. First, 
where the legislature has already spoken to an issue, its plain language must be enforced. Here, the legislature expressly banned exactly what the agency did, set wholesale pricing by regulatory fiat. The legislature couldn't have been clear when it said that the PUC, quote, may not make rules or issue orders regulating competitive prices. That's except, 39. Except as authorized. Yes. Except as authorized. And I think a helpful example of what the legislature authorized is provided uh, in my friend's uh, bench book, 39, um, 103, provides um, an explicit example of when an exception applies. But your honor, to say in this case that an agency can use general general statutory language to evade an express statutory ban would do exactly what Justice Scalia said in Radlax, uh, a court cannot do. And there the issue was protecting secured creditors. And Justice Scalia said no one, no one disagrees that protecting secured creditors is a goal of the statute. The question is, um, can, can an agency, can you ignore the express statutory means that the legislature has chosen to achieve that goal. Here, C, this is an even closer case. Doesn't C have to be read in conjunction with D that says, shall authorize or order competitive rather than regulatory methods to achieve the goals of this chapter to the greatest extent feasible? Yes, and, and, and that, that brings me to another, brings me back to another Justice Scalia point, uh, Justice Busby, which is the, um, the, the last antecedent rule. And so as we lay out in our brief, um, what, what that language is saying under the last uh, antecedent rule um, is it's, it refers to achieving the goals of the chapter to the greatest extent possible. And looking at that, uh, the PUC and, and Calpine argue that there are two goals that the legislature uh, was aiming for in delegating authority to the PUC. And one is the protection of the grid, and the other is a competitive market, but the competitive market is to, uh, goal is to the extent feasible. Why doesn't that language make the competitive market goal subordinate to the goal of the integrity, of preserving the integrity of the grid, and in achieving that balance, did the legislature uh, delegate those competing goals and subordinate one? To the other. Thank you. Thank you for that question, um, Your Honor, because I think it highlights something very important about this case. Um, we've heard a lot uh, this morning from my friends on the other side about the need to balance uh, competition and reliability. Um, this court does not need to set out the meets and bounds of what's regulatory and what's competitive, how those things could be balanced, because in this case, the agency did the one thing that the legislature expressly said it could not do, and that is set prices. No, none of my friends on the other side have ever disputed that that is exactly what the PUC did here. It's jam prices to the max. It set them there. And this argument that, that somehow that was necessary to preserve competition, um, that argument basically distills to an argument that we, we had to kill competition to save competition. Because there was no, there's nothing competitive about a set price. In fact, that is, that is the most anti-competitive action one can imagine, which may explain why the legislature took care to prohibit that exact, that exact act. And I think it's also significant, Nurse, that this is the first time since the legislature overhauled the Texas market decades ago, that the market was abandoned for a price set by the government. And I, I also have to disagree respectfully with my friends on the other side who suggest that somehow um, the market was in disarray, the market was not working until the PUC stepped in and raised prices to the max and left them there for days. In, of the in market, the, in the the subsequent legislative session, did the legislature look at all of this and consider whether unwinding uh, these orders 
was uh, best path forward or something different, and they adopted this securitization program instead. Uh, would that, what, what do we do with that in connection with your argument that the prices need to be unwound? Yes, the two, prices need to be unwound. Well, two point, two, two answers, um, two responses to that, Your Honor. I think first, um, the the relevant. The relevant statutory scheme for evaluating the invalidity of the rule um, is what was in place at the time. But second, I think securitization, that bill actually um, helps, helps us and helps the court see that uh, resettlement, um, which again is an issue for another day, was expressly contemplated by the legislature. Because also in the securitization bill, and we point this out in our brief, the legislature said, look, I mean, securitization is ultimately um, a loan that the people of Texas are going to have to repay. And the legislature's made provision and said, look, if there are proceedings, um, judicial review um, of the rule or the uplift charges, um, and, and there is recovery out of those administrative proceedings, um, that will affect securitization. So I think, if anything, the legislature acknowledged the, these proceedings or proceedings um, for judicial review of the rule and sort of sort of baked that in. So the legislature certainly certainly could have handled it in a different way, but I think the legislature recognized that it is the province of this court of courts to say what the law is, to say how administrative agencies acted within the bounds of authority that the legislature has set for them, both in terms of statutory authority for what they can do and in terms of the APA rulemaking authority, which provides a, an independent and alternative basis for affirmance uh, here, um, because we think this is as clear a case as we believe this is of an agency not staying within its lane and busting through um, the rails the guardian rails that the legislature has put in place with respect to its statutory authority to do the one thing the legislature said it couldn't do, that's just as true on the procedural side of this as well. That the agency really says uh, substantial compliance, um, but I don't think uh, not even trying can count as substantial compliance. And, and, and just as well to your question about the filing, the filing requirement, I think it's important to understand there's a filing requirement and then there's the effectiveness requirement. The effectiveness requirement is not subject. The legislature was very clear about what, what requirements of rulemaking could be subject to substantial compliance, and the effectiveness, the effectiveness requirement is not among them. And I think the reason for that is straightforward because that's sort of an on or off switch. Um, it's, it's either filed or it isn't. It either becomes effective or it isn't. And that, that is an independent and alternative basis. But they're sort parties. of intertwined, right? Because it's the filing that makes it effective. Yes. So, well, so, so here's if, if the filing is subject to substantial compliance, but the effectiveness is not, but the effectiveness depends on the filing, then how does that work? Here's how I think about that, Justice Buffy. I think you can imagine a scenario, let's say, where an agency files, say, an incomplete. So there's no question that there was filing in that case. The question there would be, all right, was there substantial compliance? In other words, you, you, the rule's effectiveness wouldn't be an issue in that case. The question there would be, you know, is there substantial compliance on the agency procedurally to do that? Is what it filed enough um, to count as substantial compliance? So that's how I would that's how I would think about about those two reports. I think they I think they they work they work together. Do you know if the Secretary of State can, can you file after hours, or do you have to do you have a drop box or electronic filing, or is this an old-fashioned nine-to-five thing where you have to go in the office and stamp something? No, Your Honor. The, the, it, it's very clear. It can be filed by email um, with the touch of a finger on on a keypad. And just to your question about what what would be the impact um, of holding this is this is a rule. Um, the legislature took that concern into account when it streamlined requirements for agency rulemaking. Um, and it set out, it provided, it provided for agencies to be able to act quickly 
in times of, of emergency. Um, I think the agency here, had it followed those proceedings, could those rulemaking requirements could have done what they did in, in, in about an hour. So the legislature has already taken into account the need for agencies to act expeditiously, and no one is arguing here, Your Honor, that any any or any order or any internal directive um, inside an agency is necessarily a rule. We're simply asking the court to apply the long-standing framework um, for what counts as a rule that has long existed, that agencies have long acted. Um, within it to this case. You agree yes, that to, uh, ordering the DEC was authorized to order outages. Why isn't that anti-competitive? Yes, certainly. Uh, two, two reasons for that, Your Honor. Um, the first, I think it's important to underscore that the load shed orders um, were actually to uh, transmission and distribution utilities. Um, which, as, as, the, as the court knows, when the legislature overhauled the market, it sort of created um, two complementary but different regimes, right? There's the regime for generators, which is under the competitive regime, and then there's the regime for the TDUs, um, and that's under the regulatory regime. So when, when ERCOT ordered load shed, um, that was an order going to the to TDUs. Secondly, even during load shed, the competitive offer market was working and was going was going forward. So even when load shed is ordered, and, and in this storm, even when load shed was going, the competitive market um, was working. Prices were hitting uh, the then cap of nine thousand. Typically, you'd expect the prices to be around thirty dollars, and prices were averaging around twenty four hundred. So the, the failure in this case isn't the failure of the market. Um, it's the failure of the agency to follow the law. And so it, we yes, just understand your position that, in fact, this did not keep the lights on and there were other forces that did and they were you know, mistaken in their judgment about things. But it, it, imagine a world where they're right that in, in order to avoid some kind of catastrophe or, or, or a worsening catastrophe, they need to do something like this. And they need to do it immediately. And, and imagine a world where that's true. I, I can't help but wonder: is, is it really, is it really your position that, uh, that that they're tied to the mast of competition in a way that prevents them from taking uh, that action? If, if if we are in a world where it actually is the case that they just have to commandeer the market for a little while to make sure that uh, we're not in the stone ages for. Two responses to that, and let, let me let me back up. Um, I think it's important to recognize, and this appears on the face of the orders. The orders themselves reference that ERCOT had gone into its highest alert. That's EEA three, and during the highest alert, all generators who could run had to run and had to be online. So. That, that was, that's a feature, that was part of the order, that, that was already in place. So I just think it's important to acknowledge that as part of the order, everything that could run already was running. And that's not an attempt to go back and second guess. That's just part of this court's job in terms of looking at a rule. What was the problem the agency was trying to solve? Uh, absolutely. And what were the but, means that it? If we can imagine a world where it's true that the only way to <laughs> stop a catastrophic situation is to commandeer the market in a way that's obviously very anti-competitive, is it your position that they lack that authority? My position is that the legislature has made that call. And the legislature has said, of all of all the all the trees in the garden, these things you can do, but there is one that you cannot, and that is set, regulate wholesale electricity prices. There is a vast wealth of tools that that the PUC that the PUC could could use. We've heard some of those tools today. Um, talk talked about well, wouldn't a really here throw those tools into question? Um, absolutely not. Um, and the big reason is none of those rules, not load shed, not the cap, 
not R U R not ruck R U C. Um, none of those things disrupt what's at the heart of the competitive model here, which is the competitive offer market. The competitive offer market goes on. None of what those about the existing uh, low offer cap, high offer cap that are part are part of the contractual agreement that everybody signs on to that existed even aside from this shortage. Uh, are, you, are those anti-competitive rules that are invalid? No. And, and before I explain why, let me address one thing that I think is important to, to tease out of your, of your question, which is all of these things were part of the market rules that everybody in the market knew about um, before. Um, and I do have to take issue, respectfully disagree with my friends on the other side. Load shed, that had been debated, that had been considered multiple times, um, uh, whether that should be part of the scarcity pricing. And each time, it, it was rejected. And if you'll just allow me well, to they, they argue that it shouldn't be double counted. In other words, they say, look, the rolling blackouts, the, the, sh the load shed, um, didn't get counted at all in, other, as in, in terms of taking care of the, of the market imbalance between supply and demand. Yes, two, 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 two points to that. Um, I think when they, when they complain about it not getting accounted for, my first response is that's the system design, and that's what all market participants knew because it had been debated and discussed and rejected. Secondly, I think as, as a matter, and I think your question really hits on something important, because a, as a matter of fundamental economics, um, if the demand has been taken off as it is during load shed, if anything would double count, it would be counting them again. That's putting a thumb, that would be putting a thumb on the scale of demand. Again, this court doesn't have to wade into those sort of policy and factual issues in this legal challenge. All it needs to, to hold is that the agency here did the one thing that the legislature said in clear terms, and there's been no claim in this case that anything's, anything's ambiguous. We have clear statutory text saying the agency may not do this. And I think it also this says that the agency may not issue orders regulating competitive electric services as well as prices. Yes. So why isn't the order everybody has to produce, you have to sell regardless of whether you want to or not, why isn't that just as anti-competitive as saying here is the price at which you must sell? Sure. A couple of things, a couple of responses to that, Justice Kagan. I think first to, to um, go back to our previous discussion, um, nothing in that disturbs the fundamental um, competitive offer uh, mechanism that, that would work. And, and the other thing is that component of having generators stay online um, is not the whole story. You have to look at the whole, yeah, you can't just look at part of the tool, you have to look at the whole tool. I think and the other part, with you well, and the other part of that tool um, is um, uh, make whole payments um, and, and true up. So that, that at the end of the day, in stark contrast to the price setting rule, Right, which eliminated the com eliminated competition, set the, set the price at nine thousand, and held it there for days on end. The competitive offer market works, and you do get at a fair market price at the end of the day. So I think that's a huge difference between this rule and that. To say that, that factually, fundamentally, what happened here was that the computer system incorrectly read the reserves in a way that made it think there was no load shed. And I have to differ. Um, that that is a narrative um, that my friends on the other side tell. Um, it is a it is a false narrative. The system was working as it was designed. All right, generators were making offers, and nothing stopped a generator from offering at the nine thousand cap if that's what the generator needed to run. Nothing prevented that. That's why we saw during the time period. That's why we saw the price at times hit 9,000. And that's why we saw it vary between about 1,200 and, and, and 4,000. So it's simply a false narrative that something was wrong with the program. The program was running as it had been designed. The problem was that some market participants, and perhaps the commissioners, um, thought that prices should be fixed and should stay at the cap throughout. 
for days, even though that very possibility had been discussed as a reason to reject. And what the PUC said in rejecting this, this, this scenario, the exact same scenario back in 2006, was that there's no need for an administrative, and they called it an administrative price-setting mechanism. Because even during times of scarcity in the past, we see the market oscillating. We see the market working. So we don't need to do that. If, if the system had been designed differently so that in these exact circumstances, it would have put the price at 9000 for not just allowed them to get there, but would have essentially forced everybody to get there, you would have no complaint about the PUC's authority to design the system. Well, I think I think that the complaint would be a different one um, than than we have than we have now. That would be a different case than the one that that you have you have before you. Um, but certainly, at least in that case, you would have a situation where everybody knew what the rules of the road were, um, and they weren't changed in the middle in the middle of the game. Um, I see my time is right. May I sum up just for a to get a minute? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. On every issue in this case. The PUC has staked out a breathtakingly expansive view of agency power that puts agencies above the law. On jurisdiction, the PUC says its actions are completely unreviewable and Texans are stuck with the bill, whether it acted lawfully or not. On statutory authority, the PUC says the legislature's limits on its power are just suggestions, um, judicially unenforceable suggestions for it to consider. And on the APA, the PUC says it didn't have to comply with the legislature's rulemaking requirements, didn't try to comply with them, and doesn't need to comply with them now. This isn't just agency overreach. This is agency omnipotence. This court should enforce the clear limits the legislature has placed by affirming the judgment below. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Hope. Thank you. start with the notion that we are peddling a price that falls to down there. And I would point this court specifically to pages 814 to 815 of the text of text gen's appendix, which again isn't properly before the court because factual questions of the type that were being discussed are not pertinent to this type of rule challenge. But on those pages, Luminance on CEO called this a glitch and a pricing mishap and that the action of the PUC was appropriate as a way to promote conservation of demand which is as important in these circumstances as promotion of generation, because there has to be a balance between supply and demand or the system fails. Turning to the question of whether the PUC did the one thing that they couldn't, and Justice Land, I think you have exactly right, that here, that competition is important, but it is subordinated to reliability. And this goes to Justice Busby's point that they can't issue a price regulation except as otherwise authorized. And reliability is where it is authorized. I would point this court to multiple different statements along those lines, including 39.15582 and even 31.0029, which defines the role of ERCOT in terms of reliability, but competition isn't mentioned. Now, if that weren't enough, I would point the court to 25, so 16 Texas Administrative Code 25.501A, which since 2003, as far as I can tell, has said, said something along the lines of, except as otherwise directed by the commission, ERCOT shall determine the market clearing prices of energy and other ancillary services. This court gives the case to be some limit uh, to the goal of reliability in terms of uh, its effect on competition, though, because otherwise uh, the, the uh, PUC could simply order market participants to do whatever the PUC wanted it to do, regardless of uh, any, any impact it had on the market. What, what limit is there on this goal of achieving uh, reliability and integrity of the network? So I agree with my, my friend on the other side that this court doesn't have to get to the exact means and bounds of that. But I would point <laughs> the court, again, to 39.001C, which they were talking about having being unable to issue price orders and read it in the context of 39.001A, which says the PUC can't, involve, can't engage in the type of rate making that had been issued previously. So the limitation is the, the goal is the, is the market to the extent 
uh, possible without, subs without preventing reliability. So the, the PUC, the one thing the PUC can't do is engage in rate making, and it can't prevent competition as a general principle. But where there is, again, in situations, no competitive market because we are in load shed and demand has been forced off the market, that is when reliability becomes the most important and one that the subordination becomes most critical. Turning to procedurally what we can't do, there, the, my opposing counsel pointed to the fact that the effective date is with, with substantial compliance. The effective date, however, also doesn't fall within the scope of 2001.038, which is the provision for judicial review. That is significant because, as this court noted in Houston Municipal em uh, Employee Pension Assistance against Farrell in, in 2007, there's no right to judicial review outside what the legislature has provided. So if it falls outside the substantial compliance requirements of, of 038, there simply is no judicially enforceable mandate. Finally. <laughs> well, not finally, but going back to what the court, what the market expected, again, I would put it in Luminant's own words to the extent the court is going to go beyond the record. On page 47 of the sub, of Calpine Substantive Supplemental Appendix, a representative of Luminant, Amanda Frazier, said, I agree with you that it should be the case that prices are at fall anyway because of the aspect of the ORDC, of the effect of the ORDC. That is why there was not a separate counting of the <coughs> of load shed in this particular formula. Now, finally, I heard my, my opposing counsel say that they could have complied with the requirement in about an hour. They had four and a half to five minutes. That is how long they were, they were short um, of that, how long that the PUC had to fix the problem before we would have been in Stevens, Justice Blacklock's terms, the dark ages for months. Under those circumstances, the emergency rules were complied with substantially to the extent they were required at all. If there are no further questions, we would ask that you first. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Pitt. The, the uh, case is submitted and the court will